Exposition by Charles Hedden Spurgeon Revelation 7, 9-17, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-28, 50 58 We will read two passages from the New Testament tonight. The first will show us where the glorified saints are and the second will tell us what is to become of their bodies. Revelation 7, 9-13 After this I beheld, and, lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honour, and power, and might be unto our God for ever and ever Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me. In reply, as it were, to John's question put by the very look of his countenance. Sometimes the Lord Jesus Christ gave an answer to men who had not spoken to him, and the angelic elder here followed his example and also, in another respect, imitated his Lord by replying to the inquisitive glance of John by asking him a question. 13 to 17. Who are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. This is to be the future state of all those who are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus and to whom the saving grace of God has come. So that, concerning all who have thus fallen asleep, we sorrow not as those without hope, for we know that all is well with them forever. Now let us read a little of what the Apostle Paul was inspired to write with regard to the resurrection of the body. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. What, then, was this gospel which Paul had preached, and which the Christians in Corinth had received, the gospel which Paul declared would save them if they truly believed it? Was it a gospel made up merely of doctrines? No. It was a gospel formed of facts. 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That is the first fundamental fact in the Gospel system. Blessed is the man who believes it and rests his soul upon it. 4. And that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That grand fact of the resurrection of Christ from the dead is rightly put next to his substitutionary sacrifice, for it is the very cornerstone of our holy faith. It is one of the essential doctrines which must be received by us, for we cannot truly believe the gospel unless we accept the great truth of Christ's resurrection. 
5 to 8. And that he was seen of Cephas, that is, Peter, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this time, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me, also, as of one born out of due time. I suppose, brothers and sisters, that we may have persons arise who will doubt whether there was ever such a man as Julius Caesar, or Napoleon Bonaparte. And when they do, when all reliable history is flung to the winds, then, but not till then, may they begin to question whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead, for this historical fact is attested by more witnesses than almost any other fact that stands on record in history, whether sacred or profane. The risen Christ was seen by many persons who knew him intimately before he died, by those who saw him put to death and who saw him when he was dead. He was seen, on various occasions, privately, by one, by two by twelve of those who had been his companions for years. At other times, he was seen in public by large numbers who could not all have been deceived. These men were so certain that this was, indeed, the same Christ who had lived, and died, that, although it was at first difficult to make them believe that he had risen from the dead, it was impossible to make them doubt it afterwards and the major part of them died to bear witness to the fact. They were martyred because they confessed that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead. There is no fact in history, from the days of Adam until now, that is better attested than this great central truth of God of the resurrection of Christ. So we accept it and receive it gladly. Paul finishes up his list of witnesses by putting himself down as one of them, although his conversion was, to himself, such a marvelous display of divine grace that he was like one born out of due time. 9 to 14. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen, and if Christ is not risen, then is our preaching vain and then your faith is also vain. It is all emptiness. Our preaching evaporates, there is nothing left in it, unless Christ did really rise from the dead. And your faith has nothing in it, either, you are believing in that which is only vanity and nothingness unless his resurrection was a fact. 15 to 17. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom, he raised not up, if it is so that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised, and if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain you are yet in your sins. So that you cannot be a Christian if you deny the resurrection of Christ. You must give up Christianity altogether and confess that your faith in it was a delusion unless you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that, therefore, there is a resurrection from the dead for the sons of men. Let it always be most clearly understood that what Christ is, that his people are. There is an unbroken union between the head and the members, so that, if he lives, they live. And if he lives not, then they live not. 
and if they live not, then he lives not. Jesus and those for whom he died are so intimately joined together that they are really and truly one, and nothing can ever separate them. 18, 19. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, of all men, most miserable. That is to say, if our hope for the future is all a lie, we have been dreadfully deceived and, moreover, if we could lose a hope so brilliant as that has been to us, there would fall upon us a sense of loss so great that no one in the world could be so wretched as we should be. Besides, the apostles were always in jeopardy of their lives, if they were suffering poverty, persecution and the fear of death by martyrdom, all for a lie, dash they were, indeed, of all men the most deluded, and the most miserable. But the Corinthians would not admit that and neither will we. 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the first fruits. He must always come first, that in all things he may have the preeminence. 20 to 28. Of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet but when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The mediatorial person of Christ, as God, man, shall bow before the eternal majesty of the Godhead, that God may be all in all. Now we will finish our reading with just a few verses at the close of the chapter. 50, 51. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall not all die, some will be alive when Christ comes to this earth, again, but we shall all be changed, if not by the process of death and resurrection, yet by some other means. 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Somehow or other, such a change as this must take place before we can enter heaven, for flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 53-58. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That should be the practical outcome of receiving the great truths of which we have been reading. God grant that it may be. Amen.